How did you work with Viola? What was the... Well, <clears throat> Viola was my teacher and we were friends. Mm -hmm. and, and Viola and I talked about um, leaving our work to CCAC when it still had a C. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we realized that they weren't going to be good stewards of the work, that, that they would have to um, sell it, you know, because they don't have storage, they don't, they don't collect. So. Um, so then I decided that um, I thought it'd be a good idea to start a foundation. <laughs> and um, I was told by a lot of people, like I said before, you, that you have to have a million dollars, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, and so then when I told Viola, thinking that she would, could do the same thing, she said, oh, can I be a part of that? And I said, well, yeah, that <coughs> makes it a great idea because now it can be a group effort and we can pool our resources and, um, and you can have more than one artist, and that will give out bigger and better awards to other artists. Because my whole thing is giving money to, if possible, giving money to artists for, with no, a lot of it if possible, with no strings attached, just so they can do their work. I mean, that's, like I love what the MacArthur does in that way. Anyhow, and then um, I have these, I, I am working with somebody because my archives are, these drawings that I do, and they're called the crazy papers, because they look like a crazy person who did them. And um, I am attempting to, I would like to sell them, and I have a curator working on that, and it's a curator I met who used to work at Yale. And I'm gonna make digital copies of them so that I have a second set that is just for people to paw through or whatever. But um, they're kind of, they're sort of artwork, and then I have a, I recycle all my paint and put it into cigar boxes and, um, and so on. it's a little scatological, but um, those are all, I consider those part of my archives and I'm trying to get her to sell those. And then I have all my APs of mini prints I've done and I consider those part of my archives and I'm trying to get her to sell those. And that's all to either fund my old age, which is right now. Well, not now, but later. Later, when I, when I run out of the money I do have. Because um, <coughs> you never know. And, um, or also to, you know, so it goes to foundations so, so that we, um, there can be more money there. That's so great. Well, it's a crazy idea. I, crazy. I believe in doing stuff where people, you know, you're not supposed to do. So that's, you know, yep. yeah, but inventing you know, things. In doing this stuff of a good person, though. Generosity. Yeah. Really generosity. Oh, yeah. Should we... Um, oh, I do have... And, and here's... I, I, I will just... Can I just do this? <laughs> she has generosity. I'm sorry. I'm just a terrible person. Not at all. No, you can't. No. Anyhow, so, um, you know, on this thing of giving back. So, uh, we started in our building um, this project to invite artists to have shows because there aren't enough places for artists to have shows. So we built this box that's a window on the street and um, people come. it's called the Roll Up Project, rolluppproject.com. It's behind a roll up door in Oakland. And um, people, the artists uh, put their work up in it. And um, I'd like to be able to pay to have somebody pick it up because I don't believe artists should be schlepping their work around, but uh, we don't have money for that. But I don't have enough for my studio assistant to do every week. And so um, there are artists who don't have websites. So part of my philanthropy, philanthropy in my life is to, have, is to pay her what I would pay her if she had something for me to, of mine to do to build the websites for artists who have put oh. their work in the window and don't have websites. So, so that's our newest little wrinkle. That's great. There you go. That is wonderful. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just really great. That's so good. I love that. Yep. It's fun. Yeah. It's really so fun. Simple, uh, there, it's so there's, fun. There was one thing that came up in conversation, um, and it came up also in the panel before, uh, and that was about uh, being contemporary, the work remaining contemporary. and. Um, since most of us are facing legacy when we're older and we've already been a couple of decades beyond what the new and immediate is and very often um, we 
even though we're still alive and breathing and kicking, and then we're, the next day we're not, the issue of contemporary and the work being um, contemporary and, and of interest um, is really sort of staged center front. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what you saw in terms of the generations that follow methods to um, integrate the work in the conversation that follows different ways of seeing that the work is not um, does not become irrelevant to what's um, what the conversation is. And maybe some of you could there are all of you so what, address I'm that. sort of trying well, to interpret well, what you said. But. I, I think I think you had, you addressed it. You, it it was talked about in terms of um, the foundation um, being flexible or um, how you approach um, this work in terms of what's going on in the art scene that's going to you know, be continuing to move in another direction. Truthfully, one of the things that worked the best for us was to get involved with young people. I mean, it really was a very big deal. Farley's a young curator. He's not so young, but mm -hmm. he's, you know, young. he's 40. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, he's, he teaches at UC Berkeley. He runs the Worth Writer Gallery. And what we learned is that young people have an interest in engaging with an older generation. It's a really big deal. And they do. And it's very cool. Like the, those, those, those young women who were laying, you know, they're dancers and, and they're laying on, on the work and they're, they're using it to do their work. And that's really cool. We were totally thrilled about that. Let them do it. You know, that's work that was meant to be, it was, it was <coughs> part of an installation. So they were attracted to it. They wanted to do something with it. So it keeps it alive. You know, it recontextualizes it. And it's exactly what you were talking about, um, I think, both of you, about you know, don't, it, you don't want to fix the, pe the work in time. For what end, you know? It's like we're co constantly, I'm an art historian. It's like we're always looking to recontextualize and you know how do we make it live now? So I think it's you know you do mix it. So I work what I was saying about David Ireland too. You know, young people got involved, and suddenly there's all this new energy around the work, bringing in other people who, who might not have had any interest or didn't know about it. So I think it's like you know, talk to people, um, get to know people. Don't don't um, stay rooted in what's perhaps most comfortable. There's a lot of there's a lot of young people out there who are very, very interested in this. So I think that's, I think it's super cool myself. Do we want to, are there some yes. questions? Yeah, from, questions? Yeah, questions from the audience, from, <laughs> from all of those. Yes. You're talking about like foundations and things like that. Are you putting your studio and all of that into the foundation or just the artwork? It depends on what you want to do. Oh, yeah. See, you can build it any way you want. That could be a residency if you own the building or yeah. whatever, you know. Or you could include the street. I mean, that makes it more complicated, you know, because usually the real estate it can help fund the foundation. Right. Yeah. But <coughs> yeah. some artists do that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it, there's there's lots of ways to go. I know somebody who's doing that. They're going to do. It's going to be a residency. It's going to be in the country. It's got a couple of buildings, a studio that the mm -hmm. artist built, and um, that's what she's set up. Sharon got me to do a residency in my space. <coughs> Good. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, conversation we had last summer. Awesome. Good for you to join that. Thanks for doing that. You have a question, right? I don't have a question. I was wanted to share an observation. I'm, I'm a little bit involved in this effort myself. I, I won't unpack all of that here, but uh, one of the things I discovered was that the relationship between formation of an archive and the strategic donation of artworks to appropriate institutions is about two things. It's about establishing a durable reference value. Because if the future can't find you, you were never here. Also, a foundation lives off of the sale of art. And so you have to be willing to give art away in order to drive sales, yep. in order to support the foundation. But if the archive is not in place, and it's not organized in a logical way, biographers, journalists, researchers, won't be able to find it. A lot of artists seem to think, well, why can't I sell the art? <coughs> and the answer is that a lot of museums accepted plenty of gifts from dealers for the last three decades as ways to 
validate their inventory. And they've got warehouses bulging with stuff that they can't exhibit and don't want. And so you have to be careful about what you offer. So works uh, on paper easy because there's plenty of room in flat files. But each time a donation like that happens, you generate a press release, you generate an internet blip, you know, and the reference footprint increases. And I think this, this is something I've observed over and over again. I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn, but does anybody know the artist Richard Haas? Sure. Mm -hmm. well, I saw him the other night, and he uh, shared with me that a couple of years ago, he started organizing his own legacy, and he hired a person. In the last two or three years, he's managed to place a couple hundred works of art in museums around the country, himself, with one person. So I think there are plenty of possibilities yeah, to absolutely. succeed at this, and I think, I think it's a form of enterprise, because like finding a gallery, you have to find a place to accept your work. A lot of artists will say, you know, well, I, 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 I like to be paid. I want to make money off of this. And I have to tell them, look, if you can get a museum to accept a piece without an accompanying care and feeding subvention to pay for storage, that is a sale. You've just made a sale. And I think it's just, you know, adjusting the mindset. All of this has been really great, and, and uh, I'd love to see it. I mean, everybody ought to try to do this because it's very gratifying. Thank you. I do agree with question. Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of pooling resources. You mentioned oh, pooling, pooling resources. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about some of the decisions that you had to make working with multiple artists and maybe some of the benefits that you found uh, with pooling resources. 